And now, it's time for Ted Nugent's Spirit Campfire with John Brankus. It's the physics of spirituality with attitude. Brought to you by My Pillow. Today, the 10th of May, 2021. It is. Is that what it this is? is? Anyhow, greetings to everyone. I just felt like doing that because, Brankus, there's, there's a point to celebrate here. My name is Ted Nugent. Head for the hills, everybody, because I'm back. If I felt any better, Brankus, I'd squirt through this technology and stain your forehead with vein-popping crescendos and orgasms. I'm feeling really good, and I'm here to share with you. You would have a problem with me celebrating forehead veins popping with a crescendo and an orgasm of happiness? It, get a smile out of you, Brankus. Let me see a smile out of you. That's yeah, the it's, just, it's a little bit of a graphic description for happiness. <laughs> well, I think the ultimate happiness would include crescendos and orgasms. I don't know about you, but that's where I and come. And veiny. You know, it's the, you know. Get out of the forehead. Hey. Brown, Wilson Pickett, Ted Nugent. <laughs> hey, all I can say is we're all glad that you are safe and sound and back at it. And if anybody had any doubt, no, I mean, look at that. you. <laughs> what are you? I mean, dude, you're like all jacked up, ready to go. Uh, I feel sorry for all the animals on your property because well, God, it's, no, important you point. sat out for a little bit. As I came in, I got this funny little light, some crazy thing called the guardian angel light that just is, I mean, I don't know if you can tell how intense it is, but my God, it's, it's like police lights in your hand. 
And I, when I track an animal after dark, I lose track of Happy Sadie and Coco because only Happy lights up whoa, whoa, when he finds the animal. So I can't track him through the swamps and the forests and the fields and the Serengeti. But now with this unbelievable light, I strap this to their collars and I can literally see them from miles and miles away. But Brankus, of course, you being the bright-eyed and push, bushy-tailed, tuned-in son of a bitch that you are, you bring up the, the fear the animals on Spirit Wild Ranch would have. But let me tell you, as I entered the Man Cave Cuckoo's Nest just now for our spirit mm -hmm. campfire, the Serengeti, I'm looking at my Serengeti right now out in the dusk just before dark. If there's not... There's got to be 40, maybe 50 whitetails, a couple of great black buck antelope from India, uh, a gaggle, a little herd of African oryx. They're a beautiful giant beast the size of an elk that are kind of white and beige with a, a, a brown mask. They worked off in the Serengeti, and I just stopped for a moment, and you wonder why I'm... You know, I know you don't wonder why I'm energized, but this is one of the many reasons I am energized. A couple of things that's worth celebrating on the campfire. Wildlife turns me on. Mm -hmm. Wildlife in healthy, thriving, ideal habitat at the hands of resource stewards and ranchers and farmers and people who care about air, soil, and water quality coming from healthy wildlife habitat that also produces healthy wildlife that a canary in the coal mine. I'm like the canary in the culture war coal mine. And that it brings me such... Ah, you know, I might be the wizard of ah, but let me tell you, two black buck antelope weren't quite that lucky because I'm feeling so good. I'm feeling so 100% Ted Nugent dangerous alive for the last few days that I actually, for the first time since I got the Chinese Wuhan, I got my bow and arrow, I got my Matthews bows, and I shot every day, even as difficult it was, but I shot. I went to a tank blind, this great product from a Texas family, the tank blind, and I put out some of this uh, big time aug augmented nutrients and stuff. And after three hours of just sitting there and feeling good and seeing the antelope and seeing the deer and a big old Cooper's hawk went right by the window of the blind. A squirrel was eating. We had cardinals and probably a dozen different songbirds. This great black buck ram came in and at 30 yards, uh -oh. mystical flight of the arrow mm. was true north, samurai, planets alignment and I disconnected his pump station. Now, that's exciting enough. And then last night I did the same thing, and after sitting there for hours, the same thing happened. So not only am I back, but I'm really, really, really back. So I thought I would play what I consider the soundtrack for the Spirit Campfire with John Brankus, a fire-breathing national anthem. Did you feel it, John? Did you, did you, you feel know, it? <clears throat> I did feel it. And uh, there's a lot of love in those notes. A lot of love. Yep. And, um, by the way, yeah, I got, you know, we're starting off. I mean, I didn't keep track, but this it feels like 100. I bet it's pushing 100 campfires that we've done. And, Brankus, I just want you to know that I'm an adventurous kind of guy. I consider every day to have at least some semblance of a Northwest Passage. Shemaine and I have been doing some Facebook Lives that she's figured out, even though we blew it today. I couldn't get the microphone to work today where we simulcast Facebook Live and YouTube. And then I got a Justin Cook from the Pigman TV show. He's a techno freak. He downloads it, and we're trying to get it on Instagram and, I don't know, the Rumble and every imaginable communication network. And let me tell you, you know, we don't know the people viewing the campfire by name, though, though you see it on yours. I, when I do it with Shemaine, I can see the people's names and it's scrolling and scrolling and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. Brankus, do you share my conclusion that even though we've never met these people, that their comments are so upbeat, so supportive of the quality of life that you and I celebrate in the campfire, I, I feel... And I want to know your take on it, because you, you witness it during all the campfires, and I don't until afterwards on Facebook. I think we know these people. I feel they're sincere in their statements, whether it's 
really heartfelt or cocky or funny or a smart ass, you know, stab. I feel that the, the term campfire identifies what we're doing here. It's like we know the, I feel I know these people. Don't you get that sensation even just in the technology? Yeah, I think that, I think most of the people uh, who attend the campfire are, everyone's kind of cut from the same cloth. And, you know, we have, in over the however many episodes we haven't have done, there are so few, like, trolls. It's unbelievable. So there's just people, you know, love everyone and be kind and be an asset, not a liability. And uh, I think everyone's cut from the same cloth. So I, you know, I agree with you that, you know, it feels like we know everybody. It seems like we know everybody. I um, I, I get the, sens- the sensation, and I'm and conclusively not like partly or kinda. They're sincere. They don't need Ted Nugent or John Brankus to identify an, uh, an 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 observation or experience. I think the vast majority of people have the same experience. I think they all have alarm clocks. Not all of them, but most people get up, bust their ass, feel good about wearing themselves out at the end of the day in the asset column for their family, being productive even in these crazy times. But let, let me make a couple of comments since that's what the campfire is all about. I hope everybody... If you don't watch Tucker Carlson live, you just got to record it and go back. He may be the last source of evidence-saturated commentary. Not just commentary and then move on to a commentary. Comment and then move. No, no. He, he shows footage. He shows the doctors saying the words that he claimed they said. They don't have to make up words like the media does about me. They just put quotations around words that never came out of my mouth. But Tucker goes and finds the source. He shows the scientific paperwork. You've got to watch Tucker Carlson and when he has Candace Owens on, who the, the Democrats call Candace Owens a white supremacist. <laughs> She's black. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 you got to see the insanity that is exposed on Tucker's show when he has Candace Owens on. He had a review of a New York Times science writer for many, many years that has identified with evidence that is inescapable that Dr. Fauci, this Fauci monster, this lying, scamming, criminal, Chinese communist Dr. Fauci, watch Tucker Carlson tonight and look at the evidence that Fauci is responsible for the Wuhan virus running rampant. And it was designed to go from people to people in the most non-stoppable way. And again, it wasn't just Tucker commenting, and Ted News is not just commenting, he's got them on film admitting it, and the scientists reviewing it and admitting to the evidence. So if we're going to fix this criminality in our government and media and academia and Hollywood, we have to know the information, we have to know the facts, we have to know the evidence, and we have to drive it home to our elected employees. That That's not just a random comment. I think that is literally the cure, the vaccination, if you will, only a legitimate one, for the cultural suicide that is destroying this great country at the border paying people not to work, lying about unemployment, lying about the World Health Organization, lying about the CDC, the CDC lying about the the Chinese virus. So I'm just a guitar player, but I so care that I dig deep, and I hope that everybody at the Spirit Campfire, as often as possible, I hope daily, digs deep. And I think the place to start is with Tucker Carlson's show. What a brave ass-kicking, wall-destroying, lie-crushing guy this guy is. A real salute to Tucker Carlson. Yeah, I I will tell you what. One of the most interesting things about Tucker Carlson is how he has evolved. I can honestly tell you that five years ago, I don't think I could listen to the guy. He he was just like a frat boy, smarty pants. I like 
<laughs> he, I, like, he bugged the crap out of me. I couldn't stand anything he said. And then slowly but surely, he came around. He found his voice. He realized where his strengths were, and he played to them. And now his opening monologue is as stinky and eye-opening as it gets. Yes, as eye-opening as it gets. But let me, I believe that when I, I first met Tucker, he invited me to uh, debate Paul Begara, the Democrat from Texas, who uh, they fed me some uh, venison sausage in my attempt to answer their questions and crush his anti-gun, anti-hunting, anti-freedom, anti-constitution crap. Not Tucker. He was a moderator. I guess he's got some kind of debate credentials. I don't think they come close to my debate credentials, especially with the people who had attempted to debate me. And I have to, to this day, scrape their skull tissue from from the cleats of my work boots because I so danced on their skulls with evidence and truth and logic and common sense. But when I was there, I almost gagged on the venison sausage at at, uh, Georgetown University where Tucker was the moderator in this debate that I just owned this punk, uh, Paul Bagara, whatever his name is, Paul, whatever, but a prick. Anyhow, and Tucker was already a smart ass, but I think to be an effective debater, you can't just be Mr. Tie adjusting ever so eloquent and, 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 and considerate of the other side's opinion. The whole idea of a debate is to win with evidence, believability, uh, statistics, Um, history, uh, examples to support your statement. You don't want to be tolerant to the other side. Quite honestly, in a proper debate, you want to destroy the other side because they're debating what you believe to hold true and to be important for quality of life. So I think you're identifying that he was a little grating on you. I think there's a whole bunch of us out here that really enjoy when a guy with truth, logic, and common sense and the evidence and the panache, dare I say, the aplomb of de- delivering the evidence and support of uh, information, I think cocky slash smartass is, is probably more important now than it's ever been because the other side, as they went berserk trying to convince the viewers on CNN and MSNBC that children stabbing each other is a, ch- is a normal child activity that nobody has a right to interfere with. Did you see them do that? They tried to explain that children stabbing each other is just a part of growing up. Uh, when the cop saved the black girl's life by keeping her from getting stabbed by the other girl. So I think cocky and, and, a, and, and edgy and maybe a little too confident on occasion, Luke was talking. Um, I think that's how you win these debates because the other side is so strange and dishonest and and um, anti-righteousness and anti-good. And I think it really is a culture war good, the evidence to support good, God, family, country, law, and order, is really against the evil of the other side that's getting rid of God, that hates America, wants to dissolve the family, and believes in lawlessness. So I think an edgy, cocky presentation, I think it's essential. If you're trying to be Mitt Romney and Mr. Polite tie adjuster, you're going to lose and look like an idiot. Well. Don't you think? Well, listen to me. My major in college was rhetoric, communication studies, the theory of the argument. I can go toe-to-toe on any debate. I don't know. You know, the the smarty pants thing, this is where where Obama kind of had everyone. He was pretty button-tie, calm, you know, was never like super. I mean, look, you you like the guy or he didn't, but the guy was a great order. I mean, there's no, no doubt about it. I mean, didn't the dude I could... sold me during his presentation in the campaign and his acceptance speech. I went, wow, I couldn't have put it better than that, except for the fundamental transformation part, because he never explained what that meant. And once we found out what that did mean, then you realize that all his eloquence was lies. Regardless of what you think, the guy could present an argument. Here's my point. My point is, you know, the... It's going to be interesting to see what the rhetoric turns into if anybody can sort of break through the fray and not do ad hominem arguments. I mean, that's the only criticism that I have with Tucker Carlson is he just throws around things like, oh, one of the dumbest people here, one of the dumbest people. I love that. His argument is great without all of that. But, Ted, 
Here we go. I want to I want to be on a more positive uh, more positive note. Last week, I introduced the platform that I built to you, and you said, and you promised me, and I'm going to hold you to it, but I'm going to see if you'll do it. If we allow people to play Ted Nugent trivia over on Brinks.tv, will you give away a prize? We will draw a name. You can give away an autographed flag or anything that you want. Absolutely. We'll come up, we'll come up with a really greasy, cocky, edgy, smart-ass Ted Nugent donation item that has my signature on it. Maybe it'll be a combination. I, by the way, Brank is... You know, you, we, we hear all this uh, 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 condemnation of sweatshops and, and child labor. Well, I don't qualify as child labor, but I go into my sweatshop every day and I sign these by the thousands. And I pretty much about had it, but I'm going to continue signing these because people keep wanting them. So I will, I will do a, a, an autograph, uh, Ted Nugent, come and take it hat. And I will do a, and I will draw it with you on Brinks TV. A, Ted Nugent, come and take it flag, which, by the way, people down in Austin are putting these flags up on their front door, and the hippies go around the block. The hippies don't even go down their street anymore, so it's really very effective. All right, so we had a couple hundred people last week who logged on just when we told them to, to play uh, to play along, play trivia. You guys will be watching Spirit Campfire on Brinks.tv. All you have to do, type in to your URL, Type in Brinks, B-R-I-N-X dot TV. You just register for a free account. It actually gives you a free entry for a million dollar sweepstakes just by registering. You'll have Spirit Campfire right there. There'll be trivia that you play along with. Don't have to download anything. You just play right along. We have your name. And at the end of the show, we will pull a name out of the hat for those who have scored high enough on the trivia, and we will give you a special Ted Nugent Surprise Award. Now make and it really special. Go to Brinks, B-R-I-N-X dot TV right now. You won't miss any Spirit Campfire, and you'll have a chance to win an amazing prize. And I will uh, make some really cool, unique Uncle Ted gift. I'll figure out some cool-ass prize. Now, because we're talking about debating... And that's, I think, I think we ended up in this uh, culture suicide today because Republicans are shitty debaters. They're just they're pretty worthless. They're, they're, if, if Mitt Romney is, uh, is Republican, then they're shitty at everything. Um, he is so, um, such a facade, such fake, so transparent and petty that I know it's the worst of the worst of the Republicans, but we're, our guest tonight talking about a brave I'm gonna I know he's not coming on for a few more minutes now but this Colian Noir this guy is probably on well, my lifetime I can name a handful of people who have been effective in standing up for the constitutional guaranteed God-given individual rights First Amendment critical Second Amendment even more critical so this guy's gonna be our guest tonight he's a real Second Amendment truth, logic, and common sense warrior. Well, he's been on Tucker a number of times, and he always eloquently expresses the fundamental truth, logic, and common sense, self-evident truth of the Second Amendment, that there's no man. There's no man that can tell you, John, here's uh, your permit for the First Amendment, but it's not good in this city, and I'm sorry, you're going to need a license for your First Amendment, and we're going to check your paperwork if you dare exercise that First Amendment. Before you go into church, I'll need to see your paperwork. Before you assemble to protest the government, I'll need to see your license. There's no such thing for the First Amendment. We wouldn't tolerate it. Here we are in 2021. We're in New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Massachusetts, Illinois, and California. There is no Second Amendment. You can't keep and you can't bear. If you get caught keeping and bearing arms in New York, you're going to jail. If you get caught keeping and bearing arms in New Jersey, you're going to jail. Meanwhile, it's the cops that enforce it. I love the cops. But how, how can a cop enforce a law that is counter to his constitutional oath and it even says you're not allowed to infringe on that free person's right to keep and bear arms. Yet in New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Massachusetts, Illinois, California, and uh, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, 
and other states, they're violating their oath. So our guest, Kolyan Nuar, will join us here shortly, and I'm sure Courtney will wave a... Too bad Courtney doesn't have one of these. Courtney could go, Ted, alert, alert! That's right. Our guest is coming out, so he'll become on... Uh, John, have you ever witnessed Kolyan speak on behalf of the Second Amendment? He's, he's really one of the best I've ever seen. Yeah, it really is. You know, in the Second Amendment right thing, I honestly have gone, as you know, in, in, in terms of my journey, I didn't grow up with firearms. I didn't grow up hunting. I never really gave it much thought. It just wasn't something that was in my environment. My friends didn't hunt. Um, just wasn't just wasn't part of what I did. But now that I'm down here in Georgia and act in largely because of Ted talking about it so much, I'm like, what is this all about? And then when you kind of dive into it, and if you do your own research, I mean, it's just a, I feel like everyone's opinion needs to just be in, it just needs to be informed and authentic. I totally understand people feeling like they don't, they, they're scared of firearms. They don't like them. They don't approve. I totally understand that. But I, what I do have a hard time understanding is saying, because I don't like it, you can't have it. It's amazing. And Isn't it's that amazing, amazing? Right? It's amazing. And I, I completely respect someone's point of view on, the, on, on not wanting it or not, not supporting it. That's totally fine. So, but then when you get into the research and you just dive into the research and say, well, what do people die from? What are, what are the things that people die from? Tucker Carlson actually had an amazing um, opening monologue where he like went through the statistics about how four times as many people die from stabbings as from gunshots. So by the logic of we're trying to save people, we should ban knives. It's like, look, people die from all kinds of crazy things and crazy people do crazy things. But you know what? It, it, at the Really, when it comes right to, down to it, when someone says, should we have a Second Amendment? Should we be allowed to defend ourselves? I'll tell you what, if you ever have someone break into your house and you say to yourself, God, I wish I had a firearm to defend myself, that's your answer. Like, it, it's written into the Constitution. It seems very apparent to me that at the, at, if it comes right down to it, you're going to wish you had one. You don't have to have one, but you're going to wish you did. Well, again, you're a logical friend of mine, John. You, you mean, there, the, the statistics are so glaring, so ubiquitous, so available, so universal, that if you really wanted to stop the dam from breaking so that you could save the people that live downstream in the valley... You wouldn't spend all your time on the spot that is being debated whether it's moist or not. There's a there's a spot that, based on which way the sun hits it, looks like there's a moist spot on the dam. Meanwhile, over here, there's a gaping gap where the water's already coming through. And this gaping gap is recidivism. It's engineered recidivism. FBI Uniform Crime Report going all the way back to the 70s. The statistics of... Re repeat crime is fluctuates between 92 and 98 percent that's a huge percentage in other words the guitar player could could end between 92 and 98 percent of the violent crime the best way is when the woman's about to be raped shoot the son of a bitch save your life the evil man needs to be neutralized. You have the right to do that. You don't need me to tell you that. You know it in your heart. And what's, what's happening is as more and more gun control comes, that would-be rape victim is finding it harder and harder to access the tool to literally save her life while the court system is engineering the recidivism. So it's not going to be another gun law. It's not going to be another crime uh, 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 reform. It's going to be keeping evil the hell out of our lives. And of course, I've dedicated at least the last 50 years to expressing truth, logic, and common sense based on my God-given individual right to keep and bear arms. And I've never been in a gun-free zone except the Oval Office. I was in a gun-free zone. They frisked me. But wherever I've ever showed up for at least the last 50 or 60 years, 
no matter what that spot might be, my arrival eliminates it from being a gun-free zone because I, I know in my heart that God gave me this sacred gift of life. And with the engineered recidivism expanding in my lifetime, I know that the likelihood that I might be the next victim of all the victims that happen every day based on engineered recidivism, that I should probably carry a tool just like the fire extinguisher in my truck and the spare tires in my truck and the spare guitar parts that I have in my guitar case. I have a handkerchief and a knife and a belt tool and guitar picks and I got chapstick and a lighter and I got my reading glasses and I got a gun and a pocket full of ammo. But one of the guys that keeps right up with me that I've watched for the last number of years is our guest tonight on the Spirit Campfire. Colion Noir is probably the most sensible, reasonable, uncontestable voice for the self-evident truth to keep and bear arms. And I got to tell you, Colion, thanks for joining us and thanks for all that you've done. I love your statistical crowbar that you swing with great aplomb into the skulls of people that would cause you and I to be unarmed and helpless. Sir, you are my blood brother. Thank you very much, Dan. Much appreciated. <laughs> but I got to tell you, so where did this come from? Were you, were you, you know, John, my buddy, John Brank is here. We've done this campfire for the last year and he wasn't a gun guy, didn't have a gun, uh, didn't look into the gun issue. But when you read any newspaper or watch any news, you feel so terrible about the unarmed, helpless victim that your brain starts going, well, maybe I shouldn't be unarmed and helpless because all the people who are stabbed and shot and raped and burglarized and carjacked, they have one thing in common. They're unarmed and helpless. What a what an irresponsible choice that would be. But where did you come? How how old are you? Were you raised with guns, or is it something that came as you grew up? Where did where did your Second Amendment voice come from? Because I love it. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. I, I did not. I'm 37, and I did not grow up in a house of firearms. Uh, I wasn't taught anything about firearms. Um, Pretty much, they would just were non-existent in my life outside of maybe seeing them on, on a hip of a cop well, or something. That it, where were you born and raised? I, I was born in Houston, Texas. Okay, well, that's that's even more strange. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, I, I want to say around, I say twenty three, twenty four. Um, the number changes every every and all the years start to run together for me. But somewhere in that in that lane, I had a good friend of mine who asked me you know, just randomly out of nowhere. I didn't even know he had a gun. He's like, "Did you want to go?" He's like, "You want to go to a gun range?" And I'm, I never even thought about it. it. Never even crossed my mind. And initially, I was a bit hesitant. And then I said, "You know what? Let me let me stop being so close minded and just just try and see how it is." Um, went to a top shop in Houston, Texas. Went to the gun range. I remember distinctively opening the opening a door and hearing the pop 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 coming from the uh, coming from the bays, and I thought to myself, "What the hell am I doing?" But at the same time, I was intrigued, so decided to go forward with it. And I remember we went to the very last lane on the left hand side. He had a Taurus PT one eleven Millennium and forty Smith and Wesson, uh, which was a subcompact gun, uh, probably not the best caliber to start off with, but nonetheless. Um, I took the first shot, and I remember taking the first shot and being terrified at just <laughs> involved in the firearm, just the gun going off, the, the sound, um, the, the recoil, all of it. It just kind of threw me back a little bit. And um, then I kind of gathered myself a little bit, and I took the second shot. And once I took the second shot, it was, it was basically love it, second shot. <laughs> um, and then from there, uh, I remember after that day, I just – I. This was kind of during the days when YouTube was still kind of like, uh, it was kind of like a free for all almost where that you didn't have all the, the overt censoring so forth and so on. And, you know, you put up a video and if people liked it, it got a bunch of views. Um, so I went on YouTube and I was just consuming any and everything I possibly could about firearms. Um, any magazine I could find with firearms, I, I read it. Every gun store in my area in Houston, I went to it. I didn't really clicked, huh? I'm coming in. It really clicked, huh? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think in that first three months, I had no idea where the money came from, but I think I bought three guns. And Don't you think that that first experience 
um, that the propaganda against the guns that you can't escape really in this world, is, is, or especially in your growing up years, by that time in your life, that there, you've already been propagandized. Oh, guns are dangerous. Bad guys. Oh, the only guns when the innocent people are shot and shoot, people shoot themselves in the legs. So the propaganda, propaganda, propaganda. Then all of a sudden, I think your instinct kicked in and defied a lifetime of propaganda. And within moments, you went, this is a tool that causes discipline and challenge. And eventually, you discover a sight acquisition, breathing control, trigger control. It's all good. So you enjoyed it. But when did you become this advocate, this guy? Did you meet negative oppression against you having a gun, against being a gun owner? Or did you just witness the tsunami of anti-gun nonsense that didn't make any sense to you and you thought you'd just punch back? I think, I think that's what happened. <laughs> well, well, a lot of the programming for me, as far as the, the, the negative aspects of firearm ownership, were conditioned on a very subconscious level that I was never even really aware of. Because you're right, I, I grew up, uh, you know, being a young black male, for me, I wanted to distance myself from from the image of being um, being a gangbanger or a drug dealer or any of the sort as much as possible. And so for me, the idea firearm ownership was not something I ever contemplated because I that to me only represented a nefarious lifestyle. And when I shot the gun and, and I fell in love with it, ironically enough, it didn't happen then either. Um, what happened was more of a fascination of the the mechanics and the, the um and the physics behind the firearm. Sure. It wasn't until I started creating content around the firearm and then we had a major mass shooting and at the time I was in law school when it started, because at the time I was making gun reviews on YouTube. That was it. And then we had some high profile mass shootings. And at the time I was in law school and I'm listening. That's when I really became aware of the, the anti-gun rhetoric that takes place in this country uh, from very particularized sides of this country. And I remember thinking to myself, just on a logical level, none of this makes any damn sense. Yeah. You know, and I, that the solutions that were being proposed as far as creating laws, I'm like, well, that's only going to make it harder for me to own a firearm. And, and I, I'll be honest, and I admit, I'm thinking very selfishly. I'm like, I'm not doing anything. I didn't kill anyone. Why are you making it harder for me to own a firearm? And so in my mind, I said, this doesn't make any sense. So I figured I'd turn the camera on, and this time, instead of doing a gun review, I figured I'd state my piece in response to a lot of the anti-gun rhetoric. And uh, that, that video was titled, How to Stop a Mass Shooter. And, and that video went viral. <laughs> um, and after it went viral, I was like, oh, well, people actually care about what I have to say beyond just my gun reviews. So, and a lot of this rhetoric was continuing. So I said, you know what, I think I'll just keep doing this. Um, and so I basically took kind of like the mindset that I was developing as an attorney and was using that to study something that I was already incredibly passionate about. And, you know, as they, as different videos came online or different politicians would speak on the issue, I would respond to them and, you know, give my account of basically argument. And those videos continued to take off and continue to go viral. Um, and now here I am. Well, Kyle, I, I got to tell you, um, on behalf of not just the gun nuts like myself, but just people who know that good has to have a chance to survive evil. And with the unleashing of evil, this I, I use the term engineered recidivism. That's really that's what it is. The court system is they're do, they have to be doing it on purpose because they even keep releasing people that are 100 percent recidivistic child molesters and, and, and children rapists. They then they register them. Well, we got them registered, but they're registered in my neighborhood. <laughs> so so I think what you represent is is so such a glowing logic that is the core of the instinct of good people to want to survive an evil encounter now we failed miserably at electing elected employees to create a justice and a court and a law and order system to mitigate the incidence of recidivism so now that that's completely gone on behalf of people who cherish good over evil, uh, and, and, and even the, the, the little stuff. We like plinking. We like competing. We like things that go bang. We like blowing up bottles full of Kool-Aid. We like, we like shooting deer for the barbecue. No matter what the utility of the firearm, I'm speak 
believe me, this might seem cocky, which I'm really good at. <laughs> I'm one of these people. I am those people. They are me. Thank you. You nail it every time you bring such a, a believability factor. And John and I earlier were talking um, about debates and the ultimate determinator of who's convinced by whom is the believability factor. And Coleon, am I pronouncing that name right, by the way? Coley, I can't believe I did. I'm awesome. Uh, linguistics is my new challenge. You, you, thank you. I mean, I'm speaking for every, I know that's oddly, you know, presumption of me, but I know these people. They come up to me everywhere I go every day of my life since the 1960s because I've always done it. I stand up and go, yeah, I carry a gun. You don't? Well, you're weird. Um, and and I, I know the ballistics. I like to train with the military and law enforcement. I like to train with my buddy at the feed mill and shoot tin cans with their 22s. I like it all. If it, if, if it in, involves a gun, I'm there. And those Americans, and not only the Americans, Coleon, people all around the world who already have been infringed and are forced into unarmed helplessness, you're the man. God bless you. You're, it takes courage in this culture war. You do God's work every time you open that pretty little mouth of yours. <laughs> you make sense and you're believable. And I'm honored. I can't believe you and I haven't spent more time together, which, by the way, we're going to make happen. But your, your believability, your sincerity, your statistical delivery, and more than the stats, more than the evidence, more than the history, just the shit kicker street reality. You bring a, an intellectual and a shit kicker believability to it. And I know you hear this in many different ways, but you've never heard it that way. And this way is the most important way because in this culture war, if anybody can force any human to be unarmed and helpless, they are on the side of the worst of the worst. And you crush them every time you bring forth this street and statistical believability. So God bless you, man. Thank you. Yeah. And John is a new gun guy. Yeah. You've seen Coleon in action. I mean, is there anybody else out there? I don't know of anybody else. I'm Tucker does a great job. I've always been there. But I yeah. anybody else. Yeah, I mean Coleon has taken has taken up a specific cause and a specific voice in at a specific time. Um so I definitely listen, I thank you just for keeping the the argument real and sound and, and authentic. I mean, that's the most important thing. I mean, by far, you know, we're only going to change minds by people owning the ideas themselves, and they have to hear it in a way that they can own themselves, right? That they have to act. I, I, I don't think, I don't think, like some people do, that the yelling and screaming actually works or convinces anybody. I think that truth and logic and common sense laid out in front of somebody eventually leads someone to believe um, what they want to believe, you know, and like I said earlier in the show, I totally understand someone not wanting a gun. Just I think that the preventing somebody else from having it is where it becomes um, suspect to me. Yeah. It's, you know, Coley, one of the great uh, crowbars of truth, logic and common sense that I'm able to wield is um, when everybody takes the devil's advocate and tries to, you know, recommend new gun laws and restrictions and universal background checks and, and, and ammo limitations. I go, well, you know, you probably went to college. You probably are smarter than I am. So just take a minute and write that law. Make it, I don't know, a couple sentences long. What, maybe make it five or six. But go ahead. I'll, I'll keep the people entertained while you write the law that would have kept Kalishnikovs out of the hands of the terrorists at Paris, France at the concert. <laughs> write the law. That would have stopped Columbine or Sandy Hook or Dayton or sent. Go, go ahead. Give it your best shot. In fact, I'll tell you what. Let's meet here next week. You have a whole week to get the greatest minds in the world that will write the new gun law that will stop any use of guns in an illegal fashion. We'll meet back here in a week. Give it your best shot. And, of course, everybody knows what I just delivered is that they are virtually helpless to do so. There's no such law. 
So give us, you know, my our spirit campfire celebrants here. They are they're all gun people. <laughs> they they might not have started out as gun people, but they become gun people. And Shemaine and I, she also expresses her appreciation for what you've done. Yes, actually, I kind of hooked you guys up. Yeah. So yeah. I've been a fan of Coleon, so I've been following you on Instagram. So thank you for joining. Ted, and I want to get you on my show as well, but you are influencing so many people. So thank you for speaking out. Thank you for sharing your voice, for being bold and brave and strong because people are watching you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So share with us your last ballistic ballet. So what gun are you shooting these days? How often do you shoot? And what's your furthest shot with a 10 millimeter? <laughs> <laughs> So for the shot with a 10 millimeter, I'd have to say 189 yards, only because the range where I shoot, no matter what gun I bring on there, whether it is a full-size 10 millimeter Glock 20 or a little Ruger Max 9, I always take pop shots at the 189-yard target. Sure. Don't always hit, but for the most part, I, I tend to. Um, but uh, what am I shooting these days? I just got done filming a video about the SCAR-17, um, and, and I like to call myself a binge shooter largely because I, I'll go maybe a week or two without shooting, and then I'll have a week where I'm literally shooting every day. And so it's it's very kind of all over the place. But um, I always tell people, like, if you really want to preserve your ammo, just don't ask me to come shooting and don't put it down. <laughs> really so like Ted. Well, I'm a binge, I'm a binge shooter too. Also, I started my binge in 1956, and it continues to this day. I literally train every day with my carry guns and and my sniper stuff just to see how long I can shoot. But Colion, have you read Elmer Keith's book Hell I Was There? No, I haven't. Get it. I, 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 you and I are going to communicate off the campfire here, but I got to communicate with uh, Elmer Keith, who invented the 44 Magnum by hot loading the 40, uh, 44 specials, and it's quite a history. And I train with my carry Glock, my 10 millimeter. I got, I'm just shooting stock uh, Remington Corlock ammo. They're uh, they're. Uh, uh, golden saber Remington ammo, and I, I I know this sounds stupid. A lot of people go, "I'm oh, just dreaming." I shoot at four and five hundred yards with a ten millimeter, which means I'm aiming at the next county. But you learn how much you learn how much barrel you give under the front ramp, and I shoot it in the springtime when we when we uh, disc the fields and it gets dry. You can identify a clump out there, and you range find it. Now, I use a Bushnell laser range finder, so when it says 460 yards, it's 460 yards. And I'll take that Glock, and my first shot might be 50 feet this side of it, but then you learn where that trajectory is. And I'm telling you, Elmer Keith kind of pioneered long-range handgun hunting. And if you go into some better calibers, whether it's the 460 Smith or the 500 Smith or just a good old 44 Magnum or even good 357 stuff, but with my 10 millimeter, I have been known to hit clumps of dirt the size of a small beach ball at 400 plus yards. You know, you, you shoot, you walk it in. You, it might take half a magazine, but... <laughs> idea that trigger control at that distance with a pistol it would blow your mind in fact i'm officially inviting you on the ted nugent spirit campfire with john brankus that you got to come out here we have an yes. 800 yard range that the, the 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 real warriors the you shot with secret service yeah the secret, secret service, service by the way Colleon. by the way Colion, i shot against bush's <laughs> personal counter assault team the secret service guys i beat them <laughs> I, so, so these are the kinds of ballistic fun you can have, not just self-defense, not just whatever methodology you prefer, the right to keep and bear arms. Keep means it's mine. You can't have it. Bear means I've got them on me. Not in the safe. They're not in the truck. I'm bearing them. Will not be infringed. I don't need that interpreted. And my battle cry is that like the First Amendment, I think my Second Amendment is good in America on every street, in every building, without paperwork. And if you don't want the bad guys to misuse that, don't let them out of their cage. <laughs> what would you say about that cocky <laughs> statement? That makes perfect sense to me. It, it really... so I, have a, I have a question for you, Colian. I've seen a lot of your videos, oh. and I haven't seen any 
that you are directly speaking to women and would you recommend what would you recommend to women for because I I hear a lot from women who want to get involved in sh the shooting sports and they don't even know where to start are there women in your life who shoot or want to and what do you recommend that they do there are there are um it's a tough one because there's a there's an element where it's a lot easier for me to if I say I just want to get up and go to a gun range um, and I've never shot before. Uh, it's a lot easier for me to do that without being bothered, um, especially depending on the interaction level of the particular female. Um, however, <laughs> what? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> because what tends to happen is at least. Some, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I may or may not, if I'm at a gun range and I see a, a, an attractive young lady come to the gun range and she looks like she hadn't been there before, I may offer my services and try to help her. She may not want them, but I'm, <laughs> I may unsolicited. I you like, I got to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's an element to that where it's kind of like the motivation may be a little different. But um, from, the, from the women in my life who do shoot, and I know they shoot, um, generally speaking, going to someone who you're very comfortable with, who's in your personal life, like a friend that you know that actually does shoot and kind of picking their brain about it and then going to the range for the first time with them, um, it, it's, a lot, it's a lot easier than, say, going with uh, someone you've never met before or just go, or calling up a random trainer. And so even though the random trainer, so what I've done in my past before, um, like with, with ex-girlfriends that I was in relationships with, we'd go to the range and I really wouldn't take them to the range to teach them. I teach them enough to just shoot, um, but not necessarily to develop proficiency. What I would do after the fact, because I just want them to become familiar and comfortable shooting. And then from there, what I would do is I would get a friend of mine who's an actual trainer trainer and then bring the stranger in who trains and then bring them together and then learn the proficiency aspect of it. That's good. Yeah, yeah have that kind I had a great teacher. So well, I, I, I got to tell you, I, I, I don't want to brag, but I really have the introductory mantra. And, and I mean this, and Shemaine's a perfect example. Yeah. Um, introductory. First of all, it should always be a revolver. I think the first time a person fires a pistol, a handgun, it should be a revolver. And they should open it and close it and dry fire it and open it, spin it, close it, latch it, cock it dry fire they should do so they become familiar with the mechanics you you mentioned that earlier and then i always start with a 22 revolver and i use cb caps which have no recoil and no report so there's there's no surprise yeah, as you mentioned yeah. your first shot was quite a, a culture shock the first bang if it's a anything bigger than a 38 but and i make them dry fire that empty gun at the target at 10 feet Getting the sights, dry fire sights, dry fire sights, open, don't load it, dry fire sights. The first rounds in that cylinder, every child and every woman that I've ever introduced that way, they shoot a one-inch group because their their mechanics with a CB cap, there's no bang, it's kind of a kind of a pop and nothing moves so they're already doing something they know when the ignition of the trigger drop is and they do it over and they go well, I can do that I can do that and they get a little frustrated I go no do it again without bullets in it their first shots every shot goes in the same damn hole because psychologically I have eliminated recoil and bang so all you guys out there if I hear another guy go yeah my little lady wanted to shoot. I gave her a 10-gauge double, blew her on her ass. <laughs> I don't teach her. I mean, guys actually say that and do that, which means they're turning their little lady into an anti-gunner. So go just the opposite. Make it as comfortable yeah. and un undemanding and stress-free as possible. But that's a proven methodology with my children's camp, the different children charities that we do, and all of Shemaine's friends, and they, and they fall in love with them with ears and eyes go up to lightweight cowboy 38 yeah. special loads that still don't have much of a recoil but still a revolver because they that something about the mechanics you don't want a gal to introduce hammering with a jackhammer you probably want to use a little small four ouncer and some brads <laughs> so, so this is my proven methodology so in your quest to expand second amendment rights which you do with such such a, a believable and effective way um, I hope I can join you and unite with you as often as possible because you've been a voice for freedom 
You've been a voice for good over evil, because that's really what ultimately keeping and bearing arms is. If you're unarmed and helpless, evil can do, do as they damn well please with you. And that should never be allowed. And when you keep and bear arms, you can terminate that threat and that life threat. And uh, I got to thank you again on behalf of everybody out there. And I don't know uh, what we're going to do with uh, the big NRA convention. It's always good to see you. You're always yeah. busy and I'm always busy. But I'd like to think that two black guys like you and me <laughs> should walk down the aisle together. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and get the word out there to the masses. So uh, do you have any final uh, words, Coleone? Because uh, it's been such an honor and a privilege to have you share this campfire. And the reason it's called a campfire, because people are gathered around here and they listen. And this is an important, I, in fact, I think today, wouldn't this be the most important subject out there? I mean, we're worried about the border. We're worried about unaccountability, fiscal, you know, orgy. We're, we're, we're pissed off about the, the scam re, uh, shutdown around the Chinese virus. But the right to self-defense, is there anything more important today? I don't think so. Um, and, and, you know, for me, one of the things that a lot of people miss out on is the, the added value that comes with firearm ownership that people don't talk about that are non-gun related. Because with a firearm, once you start carrying a firearm, at least with, for me, once I started carrying that firearm, I started to realize that now I'm in a position to, I'm in control of protecting my safety. Yes. I hadn't had that mindset before. And so what that happens is that started to permeate other aspects of my life. So I started saying, okay, well, if I can be self-reliant from the standpoint of protecting the most valuable thing that I have, what other aspects of my life can I improve on? to do the very same thing with the same level of efficiency. And so from there, it started to improve me as a person. It wasn't just a matter of me just shooting a gun and just saying, you know, hey, I like shooting guns. No, it started to improve me as a person. And so I think when, when we talk about the idea of firearm ownership, I think there are a lot of people, especially on the other side of this debate, who just automatically like to pigeonhole the firearm into this nefarious thing that um, can only be representative in a negative way. And then from a self-protection standpoint, there's only, uh, okay, I can kind of see where it's coming from in that regard. But in reality, the most important thing about firearm ownership, especially if it's able to happen mass scale, is the idea and the notion of self-reliance and personal responsibility and accountability from the standpoint of saying, this is a firearm, I can do good things with this thing, and I can do bad things with it. And, I, and I've always said it before in all the shows that I go on, and I, I say it over and over again, the last thing the government wants is a population of people who have an independent, self-reliant mindset. And to me, the gun serves as a catalyst for that thought process. You know, it's certainly a metaphor for a declaration of independence, autonomy, and uh, individual freedom. So, Thank you for that. And uh, it, again, you uh, you brought uh, a, a real believability factor to this uh, obnoxious debate whether whether people have a right to keep and bear arms or not. As I said before, the most important thing in this culture war, I believe, and I mean this, these are hard, hard ass words, but being a member of the NRA, Gun Owners of America, and the United States Concealed Carry Association, USCCA, because when you're a member and and visible as a gun supporter, the other side cringes. Just the sheer numbers of NRA members and Gun Owners of America and United States Concealed Carry Association, just the numbers scares those people who want to control our lives and want to browbeat us into dependency. So a lot of people go, gee, what can I do? What can I do? I just told you what you can do. Give out NRA memberships to everybody you know. Give out Gun Owners of America memberships. Give out United States Concealed Carry. The, their magazines are full of information that CNN would crush at every opportunity. And the, the propagandists and the, the freedom haters do everything they can to stifle. So just membership in those organizations will give you statistical evidence to counter someone who thinks unarmed and helpless is a good idea. So that's my battle cry for the night. So thanks again. Coleone, and I hope that we get together sometime, but you stay on course and uh, you're doing God's work out there. We all salute you for that. Thank you so much, Dave. All right, man. See you. See you at the gun range. ASAP. <laughs> I'll be there Wednesday. <laughs> all right. God, what a great guest, boy. I got to tell you, Linda just told me that this is our 71st show tonight. Wow. Wow. Uh, I've had such a riot. We started out paying tribute to the heroes of the, of the military and their families with yep. the 4th of 
July celebration. We're approaching the 4th of July a year later where this freak in the White House and his uh, henchmen are claiming that uh, we should wait for their authorization to celebrate the 4th of July and that if he sees fit and his henchmen see fit, that maybe we can have a gathering of family as long as we social distance in the backyard in between burger flipping. Um, this has been a great run. Thank you for inviting me that very first time to tri pay tribute to the U.S. military and their families. And I want to announce tonight that there will be a continuing spirit campfire. Shemaine and I have been doing Facebook Lives, and when we, when we get this stupid <laughs> technology figured out, we, we simulcast on YouTube. We're trying to put it on all the platforms. We would like to continue doing it on Brinks TV, so I want to make sure that my gang works with Courtney. But officially, the spirit campfire will rage on but it's going to be more spontaneous. I'm not sure it'll be every Monday at 9 because John and Courtney, we all have the evidence that the big tech powers, they know that we're coming on at 9 and they censor us. They reduce our reach. They intentionally reduce our, our voice. And we found Shemaine and I lately, just all of a sudden in the middle of the afternoon, testing a microphone that oftentimes we have more of a reach on a spontaneous Facebook, YouTube, than we do on this beautiful spirit campfire. So Courtney and Herbert and John, thanks for helping create this. We're going to continue to strategize and pull off some maneuvers so that we can get past the censorship. Um, I'm not sure what, in fact, I, I don't think I'm going to announce the schedule when I'm going to do Spirit Campfire. It, but might, I, it might be best if it's spontaneous. Yes. Like when it, you do a random Facebook Live, they can't you, keep up your with numbers us. are through the roof. It's yeah. crazy. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So thank you all for this wonderful Spirit Campfire celebration. John, you are my blood brother. We still haven't even met in person yet. We still have to pursue that. <laughs> Got to somehow get Courtney around the, the the firing range and around the campfire with some real back straps included. But uh, I I'm so pleased and so moved that we've become friends through just this silly technology. Which brings me back to my opening statement: the sincerity, the shared belief system, the positive energy, the physics of spirituality with attitude. It's almost like we've known each other forever. And that you lived a life before we met. I lived a life before we met. But good is good. And good enhances good. And I salute you and consider you my blood brother. Absolutely. Well, Ted, you, we will, uh, you guys will carry the torch of the security campfire. I think the spontaneous way is, is the way to go. I think that the engagement is a lot higher when, uh, you know, people don't know that it's coming. I think that's awesome. And we will definitely be crossing paths because I'm coming down to the ranch, got to yeah. go hunting, so um, got to do salute across America, and I'll be popping up here and there, and uh, we'll have a blast. I see the beach in the background all the time. It's like too much, John. No, John, uh, it's, it's me thinking I'm the most important thing, I'm going to have Shemaine do this okay. because I want to thank everybody for your support. I want to thank you for giving the middle finger to the cancel culture who are just driven by hate and where H-E-B grocery stores and Kroger and Target and Disney and Delta and Coca-Cola and Bed Bath & Beyond crushed a great entrepreneur like Mike Lindell. I want to pay tribute once again to what I consider a super, super great American patriot and a man who exercises his First Amendment perfectly and has been crushed because he's doing it. And the best way to fight back against the cancel culture is to support somebody yes. like Mike Lindell. So, Shemaine, if okay, you, you so see this. Okay, so Mike Lindell, the inventor and CEO of MyPillow, wants to give back to our listeners here on Spirit Campfire. You can get great discounts on all MyPillow products if you go to MyPillow.com and click on Radio Listeners Special. And then use the promo code SPIRIT, which kind of makes sense. I like SPIRIT. And they'll know that Uncle Ted sent you. So you can get deep discounts on MyPillow mattress toppers, which are amazing. I have them. I was... We, we were MyPillow freaks before he ever came yes. on the SPIRIT campfire. Yes. Especially the dog beds for Sadie. <laughs> I, I got everything. <laughs> I got everything before uh, we really got in touch with uh, Mike Lindell. So... I can say that these are tried and true. I sleep with Mike kind of every night. 
No. Yes, okay. you do. I you snuggle. Night, yes. you, we actually spoon the dogs on the My Pillow <laughs> dog bed. The yes. best dog bed. We've always been idiots. We buy the bed. That's a great dog bed. That'll be better. Let's get that one. <laughs> the My Pillow dog beds. The dogs. They fell in love with them the minute we unwrapped Absolutely. Them. So you can get deep discounts on MyPillow mattress toppers, towels, and more. Like the buy one, get one free offer on Giza sheets. Enter promo code SPIRIT or call 800-945-9175 for these specials. That's 800-945-9175 and use promo code Spirit. All my pillow products come with a 60 day money back guarantee and a 10 year warranty. I mean, I'm not kidding. This is an opportunity where the Marxists and the, the America haters and the open borders and the, the forced unemployment and paying people not to be productive and, and refusing to be accountable with our tax dollars, those people can be pushed back by just supporting somebody like Mike yep. Lindell. It, it, it literally does that. So tell those big corporations like Walmart and Bed Bath & Beyond and Target and Delta and Disney and Coke and, and Starbucks, tell them to kiss your ass that you're going to buy Mike Lindell's products even more. Vote with your dollars. Yes. Yeah, so so dollars. Courtney, I love you. John, I love you. Everybody out there in the asset column kicking ass for God, family, country, and law and order, make sure you call your elected employees and let them know that there is no systemic racism, that there's no white supremacy. It's just, it's just not there. If it is, it's meaningless. We, we, de we destroyed white supremacy back in the 60s. We destroyed systemic racism back when the Democrats filibustered against the Civil Rights Act. What? Who doesn't know this stuff? Anyhow, the Spirit Campfire will continue to roar and watch for Shemaine and I and John on Facebook and YouTube and Brinks TV. John, you send me the links and all the, the data and all the bullet points for Brinks TV, and we'll keep this fire roaring, buddy. Awesome. Well, God bless, everybody. We will see you who knows when. Who knows when? Yeah. I, but, but everybody, thank you for your prayers. Can you see how dangerous I am? I'm actually, yeah. there are flames coming out of my ass there because are. you people prayed for me. There are. So I God guess. bless everybody. How do I get out of here? So can I Down get out there. of here? Leave. It says leave. All right.